So Sam Altman is asking Congress to regulate the AI industry. Is this a trap? Google's leaked documents show that they're rapidly losing their grip on AI. And now OpenAI releases a proposal for how to govern AI and calls for immediate action. Seems like something's happening behind the scenes. Let's take a look. So here's a 30 second timeline of what happened with AI in the last six months. Is that right? It's been six months. It's been less than six months. This is unreal. So OpenAI releases ChatGPT late 2022. This is like the starter's pistol that gets everyone racing towards developing the most advanced AI that they can. It's not just US tech companies, it's global players as well. China launches the Ernie bot. Russia launches GigaChat. Britain tries to launch BritGPT, which I vote should be called GPT. Just, just do it. Bill Gates apparently managed to buy 49% of OpenAI before anyone even knew it existed. So Microsoft is putting ChatGPT into everything to, in their words, make Google dance. Then Meta slash Facebook comes along and releases their model Llama, which immediately gets reverse engineered. And now anyone with a laptop has access to these models. So what does all of this mean? Well, to put it simply, the cat is out of the bag. Any hope that AI could be contained is gone. This technology is very powerful, very accessible, and it's not inconceivable that some guy living in his mom's basement will stumble on a breakthrough or hack or application that is much bigger and much farther along than what we thought possible. If you missed Google's leaked documents, here are some highlights. Google AI documents leak, we have no moat, and neither does OpenAI. This was written by a Google researcher and leaked by an anonymous Google employee. The big point here is that he's saying while Google and AI are competing and racing each other in their AI wars, another faction is beating them, eating their lunch, as he calls it, or lapping us. In other words, this faction is not winning by a little bit. It's completely beating these massive companies. And that faction is, of course, open source. That means anyone with a computer or laptop anywhere in the world that's willing to learn, experiment, and share their findings on the internet. As you can see here, Google is saying that we have no secret sauce. They have nothing that's giving them a moat, a protection of their business. People will not pay for a restricted model when free open models are available. Giant models are slowing us down. The best models are going to be the ones that can be iterated and improved quickly. You can see this in this chart. So as you can see here, this is Chad GPT, the GPT-4 version, which is, which is out of all the large language models, the LLMs is the best one as far as we know right now. Bard comes in at 93% of that. Alpaca and Llama lower still. And then this one, Vicuna, gets released one week after the meta leak and does pretty much as good as Google system Bard. So here are massive companies. This is what they produce. And this is what a bunch of people on the internet do. As this researcher says, while our models still hold a slight edge in terms of quality, the gap is closing astonishingly quickly. The online community is solving problems faster than Google could. It's solving problems that Google could not. They're basically saying directly competing with open source is a losing proposition. And that Google, we need them more than they need us. Meaning that Google needs the open source community more than that community needs Google. So what this means is that big tech is losing its grip on the AI innovation. But soon after this leak, Sam Altman and others are meeting with are meeting with Vice President Kamala Harris, who's now crowned the AI czar. Elon Musk chimes in saying, maybe we should get someone who can fix their own Wi-Fi router. That wouldn't be too much to ask. Now, whatever your politics, I think we can all safely say that the amount of people like scientists and engineers, those people are underrepresented in our political class system. Most people making decisions are lawyers. Most presidents went to school either for economics, political science, or history. And now that the AI is rolling in, it does seem like we don't have too many people in those positions that are too tech savvy. Now, right after this, Sam Altman, Marcus, and the IBM representative are pulled in front of Congress to testify about AI regulation. Now, this could be bad. There are a lot of people who are very cynical about what's about to happen. So full disclaimer, I don't think this is what's happening necessarily. And that is regulatory capture. This is something that unfortunately happens in the US. In a nutshell, this is where large companies use regulations of the US government to their advantage. They know more about the industry than the regulators, so they influence the regulators to make laws in their favor. They place burdens on smaller companies that the larger companies are able to afford and the small ones cannot. The companies that are talking to the politicians have a lot of connections in Washington DC and they have a lot of influence that others that try to enter the space may not have. Similar to how weapon companies influence foreign policy, drug companies influence the FDA. The fears that AI companies will use this new government agency as the moat that they're missing 
to keep others out of the AI development game. So there's this one theory that Sam Altman could be pushing for regulation, not because of his stated mission to bring the best of AI to everybody and to bring it safely, but rather because of how far open AI is. And basically that calling for regulation now could get him into the inner circle of people that are making those regulations. In fact, one of the congressmen did ask if he wanted to be their advisor, the person actually in charge of making some of these decisions, which to his credit, Sam Altman did say that he was far too busy. But people are questioning if this is an example of Sam Altman kind of pulling up the ladder, so to speak, meaning that now that he was able to spin up his AI model that is very effective, he's trying to get the regulations going and make sure that others can't get to that level. Now, I don't believe that's his goal. That's just my opinion. Certainly, if his goal was to become one of the richest people in the world, this would be the playbook to make that happen. If you and a few other players hold the key to a massive disruptive technology like this, and then you're able to get the government to basically outlaw any future competitors, at this point, OpenAI would grow to become as large as the other tech giants. It would cross the trillion dollar mark and keep going. Sam Altman does, however, seem to keep pushing repeatedly for something that appears to be more aligned with his stated goals, more so than just with his net worth. Keep in mind, he does not have equity in OpenAI. He limited how much money he could make from OpenAI and he limited how much the investors could make. Now, they did grant a 49% stake to Microsoft that is limited and those shares do revert back to OpenAI, OpenAI's nonprofit arm once, once Microsoft makes the investment back. And Microsoft does tend to make a lot of money from this and also gets a transparent look into how OpenAI runs, how GPT-4 runs. But still, they're sticking with their mission of trying to be more aligned with nonprofit principles. Now, all these decisions have been criticized and questioned, but it does seem like Sam Altman is trying really hard to avoid making billions of dollars. Now, it's similar how when Elon Musk made hundreds of millions when he sold PayPal, at least his shares of PayPal, he immediately turned around and put that capital into SpaceX, Tesla, and SolarCity. He almost lost his entire fortune because he needed to get back in the game and keep building. So some people aren't playing for money, at least in the sense that money isn't the end goal. Sam Altman seems to, to me at least, to be wired that way as well. So here's his tweet shortly after the congressional hearing. Something like an IAEA for advanced AI is worth considering, and the shape of the tech may make it feasible. Did anybody else read that as IKEA first? So the IAEA is the International Atomic Energy Agency that's been around since 1957, and it's an international effort to keep the world safe from misuse of atomic energy, nuclear bombs, for example. Sam Altman adds, and to make this harder to willfully misinterpret, it's important that any such regulation not constrain AI be below a high capability threshold. And he's been saying this repeatedly, including at the Congress, basically saying that really the burden of regulation should be falling on the big companies that are capable of producing dangerous AI, AI ha that has existential risk. He seems to be very careful about saying that open source communities, independent research, etc., they should not have burden of this regulation. And he adds that part because I think this is what the critics are attacking. So it's important to take this with a grain of salt, but also with an open mind. These guys set up this company in a way that would limit how much money they would make. And that was decided back in 2015 before anybody could predict how far AI would go. So either this is a long con and these are just really good con men or they genuinely believe in their mission as well as the potential dangers of AI. So in 2019, OpenAI transitioned from nonprofit to capped for profit, with the profit capped at 100 times any investment. According to OpenAI, the capped profit model allows OpenAI to legally attract investment from venture funds and in addition to grant employee stakes in the company. So here's the proposal. So the authors are Sam Altman, Greg Brockman, and Ilya Sutskiver. The first two are original founders, and Ilya is seen by many as one of the world's top experts on AI. When AGI comes online, this guy's probably going to be in the room. So it's called the governance of superintelligence. Now is a good time to start thinking about the governance of superintelligence, future AI systems dramatically more capable than even AGI. So they opened that within the next 10 years, AI systems will exceed expert level in most domains. And we are certainly already seeing that in the medical field. We're seeing that in a lot of the college level testing. GPT-4 and MedPalm are, are already exceeding human level performance. And then they're saying, that the benefits are a prosperous future, better than we can possibly imagine, but there's also a possibility of existential risk. He refers to things like nuclear energy and synthetic biology as examples of similar technology, great upside and huge downside. And so they begin talking about 
what are some things that we need to be thinking about it to create certain safety for AI development? The first thing is that they need coordination among the leading development efforts. And he's talking about how government can help, but he's also talking about individual companies. Second, he's talking about how we need something like the IAEA, just like we did for atom bombs, we also need for AI and AGI. As you're aware, if you're trying to develop weapons grade plutonium, people are gonna notice and they're gonna knock on your door and ask you some questions. Nations can't develop this material without other people being interested in what they're doing. So he, he's saying here that there might be an analogous thing for developing AI. He's saying tracking compute and energy us usage could go a long way and give us some hope that this idea could be actually implementable. But basically that the blueprint for how to control, for example, rogue nations from developing this weapon, it's there already. As we're working for 70 plus years, we should follow that same blueprint for AI. And third, we need the technical capability to make a super intelligence safe. So what he's talking about here is the alignment problem. How do we create an AI whose goals are aligned with the goals of humanity? And then again, he talks about what's not required and what should not be a part of this. We think it's important to allow companies and open source projects to develop models below a significant capability threshold without the kind of regulation we describe here, including burdensome mechanisms like licenses or audits. So he's specifically saying if you're involved in open source efforts, if you're an independent lab trying to do something like create an AI with some, some small limited application, you shouldn't need a license. You shouldn't have to be audited. You shouldn't have to report. He's specifically saying this should apply to just that sort of the companies and organizations and governments that are capable of creating something dangerous. And then he talks about public input and potential, and this is very important, but the governance of, most power, of the most powerful systems, as well as decisions regarding their deployment, they must have strong public oversight. We believe people around the world should democratically decide on the bounds and defaults for AI systems. We don't know yet how to design such a mechanism, but we plan to experiment with its development. We continue to think that within these wide bounds, individual users should have a lot of control over how the AI that they use, how it behaves. So that last part to me is very important because most of the conversation is about like, what if the AI kills us? And that's an important question, but the question that people aren't talking about as much is what if a small group of people have full control over AI and we have no say in how it's deployed? We have no access to the benefits. Maybe it has certain defaults that don't benefit us. Maybe are even disadvantageous to us. Think about your least favorite politician right now. Who really boils your blood? Who really gets your blood pressure to be dangerously high? Imagine that person having control of this AI so that it's carrying out their will. It's guarding them day and night. And it's working out scientific solutions to keep that person alive indefinitely. That's what I am personally concerned about. Second, it would be unintuitively risky and difficult to stop the creation of superintelligence. Because the upsides are so tremendous, the cost to build it decreases each year. The number of actors that are building it is rapidly increasing, and it's inherently part of the technological path that we are on right now. Stopping it would require something like a global surveillance state, a global surveillance regime, and even that isn't guaranteed to work. So we have to get it right. So I think the next 10 years could be crucial. If all the hypothetical AI benefits are real, let's assume they are, but if they are, then the next 10 years will be crucial. The next generation will either have a much better life or a much worse life. And I think that the words that are written on this page, they're historically important. This is the person that's kind of shaping the path where we're going, not just from the side of developing the AI, perhaps the most advanced AI we have right now, but also from the side of talking to our lawmakers and trying to get them to go in the right direction. Now, I personally agree with everything that's said here, at least if it's taken at face value. If all this sincere and 100% their actual mission, then I agree with every single thing that they say. It's well laid out, and there's not a lot of room for misinterpretation. If in a few months, Sam Alton starts talking about giving out licenses to anybody trying to create an AI program, we can easily point to something like this and say, well, you kind of flip flop there. We can point to this and say, well, that's not what we originally said. But I wanna ask you, what do you think? Leave a comment down below. My name is Wes Roth, thank you for watching.